page 214, chapter 12, Narratology, section Telling Stories. This chapter is about narratology, N-A-R-R-A-T-O-L-O-G-Y, which is the study of narrative structures. Narratology is a branch of structuralism, but it has achieved a certain independence from its parent, and this justifies it being given a chapter of its own. Also, because it takes much of its character and some of the terminology from linguistic theory, it seems logically to belong immediately after the chapter on stylistics. And because narratology is about stories, I'll begin with one of my own, para. A few years ago, I was in a restaurant called Bertie's, quote, B-E-R-T-I-E-S, unquote, full stop. The menu featured those highly colored, almost poetic descriptions of the meals on offer. It didn't offer cod and chips, comma, for instance, but fresh caught, succulent North Sea cod coated in a layer of light golden batter and served with a generous portion of delicious French fries, unquote. You know the kind of thing. In the catering trade, these descriptions are called narratives, an interesting fact in itself. But they worry in the trade that customers may take them literally and hence complain that the batter isn't golden at all, but sort of brownish, perhaps leaving the restaurant vulnerable to charges of false description of goods or services. So at the bottom of the menu, there is a footnote which reads, quote, the narratives are guidelines only and are not to be taken literally, unquote, stop, para. This set me thinking about narratives and narrative theory and about narratology, which we can define more closely as the study of how narratives make meaning and what the basic mechanisms and procedures are which are common to all acts of storytelling. Page 215 Narratology, then, is not the reading and interpretation of individual stories, but the attempt to study the nature of story itself as a concept and as a cultural practice. Indeed, that distinction between the actual meal, cord and chips, and the narrative account of it, the succulent, fresh-caught cord, is much the same as the narratologist's basic distinction between story and plot. The story, story within court, is the actual sequence of events as they happen, whereas the plot, PLOT, within court, is those even as they are edited, ordered, packaged, and presented in what we recognize as a narrative. This is a crucial distinction. The story being the events as they happen has to begin at the beginning, of course, and then move chronologically with nothing left out. The plot, on the other hand, may well begin somewhere in the middle of a chain of events and may then backtrack, providing us with a flashback which fills us in on things that happened earlier. The plot may also have elements which flash forward hinting at events which will happen later. So the plot is a version of the story which should not be taken literally, just like those menu descriptions. Para. The distinction between story and plot is fundamental to narratology, but the story of narratology itself is that there are many competing groups, each tending to prefer its own terminology. Hence, you will find the same distinction made with different terms. For instance, in his well-known essay, quote, Analysis and Interpretation of the Realist Text, unquote, bracket, in his book Working with Structuralism, RKP, 1980, bracket closed, David Lodge prefers the Russian formalist terms fabula, F-A-B-U-L-A, instead of story, and Suzette, S-J-U-Z-H-E-T, pronounced suje, for plot, though I don't myself see any advantage now in using these terms. Most current North American writing on narratology uses story, but instead of plot, the term discourse is often preferred. This, I think, is sensible because it isn't just plot in the narrow sense, 
which is that issue but style, viewpoint, pace and so on, which is to say the whole packaging of the narrative which creates the overall effect. Gerard Jennett, G-E-R-A-R-D, G-E-N-E-T-T-E, see below pages 222 to 231, uses yet another set of equivalent terms, these being histoire, H-I-S-T-O-I-R-E, which has the same meaning as story or fabula, and receipt, R-E-C-I-T, which means the same as plot or suze. Section Aristotle. A second story relevant to narratology is the story of narratology itself. A truncated history of narratology follows, centered on three main characters, page 216, the first of whom is Aristotle. In his Poetics, as we saw in chapter 1, pages 20-21, Aristotle identifies character and action as the essential elements in a story and says that character must be revealed through action, which is to say through aspects of the plot. He identifies three key elements in a plot, these being using Aristotle's Greek words, which are here simply anglicized but not translated. 1. The Hamartia, H-A-M-A-R-T-I-A. 2. The Anagnorisis, A-N-A-G-N-O-R-I-S-I-S. 3. The Peripetia, P-E-R-I-P-E-T-E-I-A. Para. The Hamartia means a scene or fault, which in tragic drama is often the product of the fatal character defect which came to be known as the tragic flaw. The anagnorisis means recognition or realization, this being a moment in the narrative when the truth of the situation is recognized by the protagonist. Often it's a moment of self-recognition. The peripetia means a turn round or a reversal of fortune. In classical tragedy, this is usually a fall from high to low estate as the hero falls from greatness. In identifying his three key moments, Aristotle did what all narratologists do, which is to look at a number of different stories. Greek stage tragedies in his case, asking what elements they have in common. This is similar to the way a physicist would look at different forms of matter, mountains, lakes, volcanoes, etc., and realize that they are all made from the same finite set of chemical elements. In both cases, the skill lies in the trained ability to see the similarities and consistencies which underlie difference. Para. We can see traces of these Aristotelian elements in even the most rudimentary of narrative material, such as the cartoon diagram opposite, which is a very simple, complete story taken from a packet of Brekkis, B-R-E-K-K-I-E-S, Brekkis within quote, a British brand of cat food. Aristotle, I should emphasize, saw all three elements as centered on the protagonist, the hero or heroine of the drama. But in what follows, I distribute the three elements amongst the figures involved in the story, partly because I believe that in using literary theory, we don't have to follow the maker's instruction slavishly, and partly in anticipation of the methods of Vladimir Prop, V-L-A-D-I-M-I-R, Prop, P-R-O-P-P, the next figure I will consider. So, the Hamashia of fault is the cat's leaving dirty paw prints over the tablecloth, an act which brings reproof and condemnation. Oh, Bob, don't! And page 217. There is uh, an illustration. Please ask your reader to read it on uh, page 217. And involves a peripetia or fall from grace, so that the cat is out of favor. The fall is marked by the cat's literal descent from the table to the floor. But during the tea, the visiting aunt notices with pleasure that the cloth now on the table is the one she gave her niece as a present. Of course, she doesn't know that this cloth was not her niece's first choice. But we know this from our privileged overview position as witnesses of the whole sequence of events. 
Indeed, we might say that the key to storytelling is not imparting, but the withholding of information. Readers often know things that characters don't, and vice versa, and narrators keep things back from both. The central mechanism in stories is delay, to be specific, delay in imparting this information. The Victorian novelist Wilkie Collins famously said that the formula for writing a successful novel is, quote, make them laugh, comma, make them cry, dash, make them wait, unquote, stop. Para. The anagnorisis in the cartoon is the cat owner's guilty realization that she has missed an opportunity to show gratitude and proper feeling by using the guests present when the guest comes to tea. This brings about a further peripatia, which is the restoration of the cat to favor, not a fall from high to low, but a restoration from low to high. The restoration is marked by the thought bubble, thanks Bob, by the cat's expression of smirking, S-M-I-R-K-I-N-G, self-satisfaction, and by its literal raising up now to the favoured position on the niece's lap, para. Aristotle's three categories are essentially to do with the underlying themes and moral purposes of stories being very much about, page 218, what might be called deep content, since in an important sense they all concern inner events, a moral defect, the recognition of its existence, and the consequences of its existence. The presence of these three is easy to discern beneath many narratives acting as the generative force of their moral impact. They are often the psychic raw materials or ingredients which are cooked and transformed to make up a specific narrative dish, a specific plot. All the same, in practice, a great variety of plots is possible in stories, and to describe this, we seem to need a different kind of system to Aristotle's, one which would give us a greater variety of possible actions and which would operate closer to the narrative surface, so to speak. Something like this was provided by the next of our three historical marker figures. Section Vladimir Prop. As we would expect then, later narratologists have developed more wide-ranging lists and repertoires of the constants which can be detected beneath the almost infinitely varied surface of narratives. A second important figure is Vladimir Prop, 1895-1970, a Russian formalist critic who worked on Russian folk tales, identifying recurrent structures and situations in such tales and publishing his findings in his book, The Morphology of the Folk Tale, first published in Russia in 1928. As Prop says in the foreword, the word morphology means the study of forms, so the book is about the structures and plot formations of these tales, and there is nothing in the book about their history or social significance. Already by 1928, the tide in Soviet Russia was turning against this kind of formalist study, and the book disappeared from view until the 1950s, when it was rediscovered by the structuralists, especially the anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss, who used props ideas in his own studies of myth. The Morphology was first published in English in 1958 by the University of Texas Press, translated by Lawrence Scott, with a second edition in 1968. Para, Prop's work is based on a study of his corpus of a hundred tales, and he concluded that all these tales are constructed by selecting items from a basic repertoire of 31 functions, that is, possible actions. No tale contains all the items in his list, but all are, page 219, constructed by selecting items from it. The complete list of functions given in the book is as follows. 1. One of the members of a family absents himself from home. 2. An interdiction, that is a prohibition, is addressed to the hero. 3. The interdiction is violated. 4. The villain makes an attempt at reconnaissance. 5. The villain receives information about his victim. 
Six, the villain attempts to deceive his victim in order to take possession of him or his belongings. Seven, the victim submits to deception and thereby unwittingly helps his enemy. Eight, the villain causes harm or injury to a member of a family or 8a, one member of a family either lacks something or desires to have something. 9. Misfortune or lack is made known. The hero is approached with a request or command. He is allowed to go or he is dispatched. 10. The seeker, that is the hero in questor, Q-U-E-S-T-O-R, mode, agrees to or decides upon counteraction. 11. The hero leaves home. 12. The hero is tested, interrogated, attacked, it is see which prepares the way for his receiving either a magical agent or helper. 10. The seeker, that is the hero in quester mode, agrees to or decides upon counteraction. 11. The hero leaves home. 12. The hero is tested, interrogated, attacked, it is see, which prepares the way for his receiving either a magical agent or helper. 13. The hero reacts to the actions of the future donor. 14. The hero acquires the use of a magical agent that is an object, an animal, etc. 15. The hero is transferred, delivered or led to the whereabouts of an object of search. 16. The hero and the villain join in direct combat. 17. The hero is branded. 18. The villain is defeated. 19. The initial misfortune or lack is liquidated. 20. The hero returns. 21. The hero is pursued. 22. Rescue of the hero from pursuit. 23. The hero unrecognized arrives home or in another country. 24. A false hero presents unfounded claims. 25. A difficult task is proposed to the hero. Page 220. 26. The task is resolved. 27. The hero is recognized. 28. The false hero or villain is exposed. 29. The hero is given a new appearance. 30. The villain is punished. 31. The hero is married and ascends the throne. Para. These are the basic building blocks of the collection of tales analyzed by Prop. To make the plot of any given individual tale, you put together a selection of items from this list. No single tale has all 31 functions, of course. Each one has a selection of them, and furthermore, the functions always occur in the order listed. For example, a tale may consist of functions 5, 7, 14, 18, 30, and 31. Thus, the villain receives information about the hero or victim and deceives him, but the hero receives help from an animal with magical powers, defeats the villain, has him punished, then marries and becomes king. But no tale could have a formula in which the component numbers are out of sequence, say, with 30 coming before 18, for in this instance the villain cannot be punished before he has been defeated. The order of the functions is fixed, partly because, as Prop says, events tend to have a due order. Witnesses may disagree on what they saw, but not usually on the order in which they saw it. A house cannot be bargled before it has been broken into, the method of analysis of the tales aims to show that beneath their amazing multiformity lies a quote, no less striking uniformity, unquote, page 21. To revert to the metaphor used earlier, they are different dishes all cooked from the same range of ingredients, para. Clearly, we are talking here about stories viewed in a more literary, superficial way than was the case with Aristotle. But since the variety of possible surface events is greater than that of the possible underlying motives, Prop has more variables in play than Aristotle. All the same, some of the problems thrown up by prop system will be evident after even a very brief study of the basic list of functions. 6 and 7, for instance, are two functions concerning deception of the victim or hero by the villain, but clearly only one action is involved, 
the deceiver deceives and the deceived is deceived for an act of deception requires two parties these two events then are really the same event looked at from different points of view page 221 likewise in 10 and 11 there are not really two distinct events since in 10 the hero decides to do something and in 11 he does it para the description of the 31 functions and their sub variants takes up by far the longest chapter in the book nearly 50 pages which is getting on for half the main text by contrast the possible character types in the tales are much more briefly described in the four pages of chapter 6 the characters being for prop mainly just the mechanism for distributing the functions around the story to this end he notes that the 31 functions seem to group naturally into spheres spheres within court for example pursuit capture and punishment have a natural grouping hence it makes more sense to see the seven spheres of action as roles rather than characters as this reflects the subordination of character to action a subordination which is also a feature of aristotle's narratology for aristotle says that the narrative character is only expressed in action props seven spheres of action are one the villain two the donor provider three the helper four the princess a sought for person and her father five the dispatcher six the hero seven the false hero para using the list of 31 functions and the seven spheres of action we can generate the plot of any individual folk tale in the entire russian corpus just as armed with the grammar syntax and vocabulary of english the lang l a n g u e in sosior stamps we can generate any possible utterance in english the parole folk tales are relatively simple of course but the versatility of a schema s c h e m a like this is much increased by what robert scholes s c h o l e s reminds us of in his book structuralism in literature yale university press 1974 that quote one character may play more than one of these roles in any given tell page 222 parenthesis eg the villain may also be the false hero comma the donor may also be the dispatcher etc parenthesis closes or one role may employ several characters multiple villains for instance but these are all the rules that this sort of narrative requires and they are basic to much fiction which is far removed from fairy tales in other respects unquote this potential duplication then opens up the propian methods used to analyze relatively simple material and begins to hint at the complexities of characterization and motivation which form the basis of psychological realist fiction in realist fiction the subordination of character to action is reversed and roles cannot be simply demarcated as hero and villain henry james the supreme psychological novelist once said that he wrote not about good and evil but about good and evil good hyphen and hyphen evil hence in a henry james story a would be helper may inadvertently be a hinderer or may even be unsure which they truly are footnote 2 footnote 1 is page 221 a number of the major structuralists pointed out some of these limitations and suggested refinements See Claude Lévi-Strauss Structural Anthropology Volume 2 Allen Len 1977 Chapter 8 Structure and Form Reflections on a Work by Vladimir Prop and Zvetan Todorov The Poetics of Prose Basil Blackwell 1977 Chapter 14 Narrative Transformation Footnote 2 page 222 I examine a group of James's tales using an adapted Propian method in Orbis Literarum, L I T T E R A R U M, Literarum, 
46 by 1, Spring 1991, pages 87 to 104. Quote, Embarrassment and Predicaments, Patterns of Interaction in James's Writer Tells, unquote. Back to text. So the Propian approach seems to hint at the way simple archetypes from much more basic narrative material can provide the shadowy deep foundations of complex realist fictions. The way, for instance, the Cinderella archetype, a tale found in some form in cultures worldwide, lies beneath novels like Mansfield Park and Jane Eyre. However, what props system lacks is anything about the way the narrative is presented, such as the viewpoint or the style. These are the areas focused upon by the third of our marker figures and they need to be treated in a little more detail. Section Gerard Janet. One of the most prominent narratologists since Roland Bardis has been Gerard Janet, whose work has as its focus not the tale itself, so to speak, but how it is told, which is to say the process of telling itself. What is meant by this distinction will become apparent if we consider six particular areas which Janet discusses in his book, Narrative Discourse, Basil Blackwell, 1972. In what follows, I ask six basic questions about the act of narration and sketch under each the range of possibilities identified by Janet with some supplementary categories of my own. Page 223.